welcome you all to the second annual Nietzsche Kuga Memorial Lectures. Uh, it's, uh, <coughs> I want to remind you that Spencer Block is here for three days, and there will be tomorrow evening a dinner to which all are invited, and the coordinates are up here on the board. Um, they'll probably get erased, so if they're interested, write them down. Also, um, I think Han is assembling a group for lunch tomorrow. Anyone, and you can decide at the last minute, anyone who would like to, to join the group and Spencer for lunch, uh, just go to Han's office, Han's house office at uh, noon. Is that okay, Han? If you're interested in dinner, though, it would be good if you signed up with Amy upstairs in the chairman's office sometime tomorrow so we can make a reservation. Okay. <coughs> well, it's a pleasure for us to have today um, Professor Spencer Block, who, um, of the University of Chicago, is uh, certainly one of this nation's leading algebraists and algebraic geometers. Uh, Spencer received his degree from Columbia uh, under Steve Kleiman years ago. He's been a assistant professor at Princeton and associate professor at the University of Michigan, and as he's been a full professor at the University of Chicago for many years now. And, uh, it's, uh, he's also, of course, been a visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study, IAS, also at IHES, MSRI, RIMS, GTA, <laughs> <laughs> and the only perverse institute in our, in our galaxy, uh, Mox Planck, <laughs> which doesn't give itself. In yeah. And they <laughs> <coughs> I should say that uh, years ago, uh, Solomon Lefschetz complained that uh, in the modern era of algebraic geometry, which used to be spelled with a little a and a little g, had been transformed into one spelled with a capital A and a little g. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe a capital A L G E. <laughs> um, one can, can certainly not say that, that well, the, 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 the algebraic geometry that Spencer does certainly also begins with a capital A, but it's also true that it begins with a capital G. And it's, uh, it's nice to have him here. I must also say that in, in a field which is based on schemes <coughs> and is often endowed with perversity of arbitrary magnitude, uh, it's perhaps not surprising that one has begun to seriously address the question of mixed motives. And uh, there's no one, I believe, better qualified to discuss this than Spencer Bob. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I certainly am delighted to talk. Uh, it's a little sad, the auspices. I knew Professor Kuga quite well, and at one point in my career, uh, he was really extremely kind to me. And in fact, the topic that I want to talk about is not all that uh, distant uh, from the main thrust of Professor Kuga's work, um, the theory of motives, but points of view have changed. Um, Professor Kuga was, if you, anyone knew him, you would not be surprised to know that he was primarily interested in what we would call pure motives. Uh, but, you know, the, this being the age of the anti-hero and everything, uh, we've sort of degenerated where now we consider mixed motives. Um, basically, we found we couldn't solve the problems in pure motives, and so the exigencies of getting along in one's career forced us to look for something where we could uh, prove some theorems. So what I'm going to do, it's a little curious, the arrangement uh, with, as I understand it, the general lecture to be tomorrow. So what I am going to do today and Friday is to actually assume you really want to know something about the what it is a motive. Uh, I, I won't be too technical, I don't think, but I, I will not be afraid to not draw too many pretty pictures and to actually write definition and lemma and stuff like that. Uh, tomorrow, I'll try to be a little more, uh, a little more relaxed. Um, but let's actually assume, and of course you're free to leave if I'm wrong, uh, let's actually assume that you sort of want to know a little bit about this subject and, and uh, well, I'll do the best I can. Um, I should say that the subject, the main uh, names uh, are the usual, you know, sort of trundle out the usual suspects here, um, namely Sasha Balenson 
and here the ring. And of course, there, there are others who I hope won't be insulted if I don't list uh, the whole list. Um, but so, what is the subject that uh, that we want to talk about? Um, well, yeah, how to say? The original idea, which was due to growth indeed, uh, was to talk about the the cohomology of a variety without trying to be too finically about precisely which cohomology one was talking about, one sort of looked for the collection of properties which uh, all cohomology theories, for example, we might want to look at HI, the Betty cohomology of, of X. Betty means just the usual, so I'm thinking here of X as being now defined over over some fields which maybe I'll think of as an embedding in the complex numbers, or I might want to talk about the the Durham cohomology of X, so calculated with um, algebraic differential forms, or I might be really modern, I might want to talk about the Ital cohomology of X. Here I have to be a little tricky and maybe go over the algebraic closure of K and take coefficients, some L-adic module of coefficients, or I might be really hypermodern and want to talk about the, the crystalline cohomology of x over some field in characteristic p. Um, all these cohomology theories had certain properties in common. And Grothendieck's idea was to construct a certain abelian category which was he wanted he wanted to think of motives um, for let's say smooth projective varieties uh, over a field K as being sort of a an abelian category. equipped with a functor from the category V of K. So this is the category of varieties over K. A functor to this abelian category, which should be sort of universal. So we'll pick an HI, we'll pick a cohomology group. And it should factor, if we have any of these other cohomologies, to, um, well, to the abelian category of vector spaces, or actually it's better, better to work with, with vector spaces throughout the thing, so some, some category of vector spaces, then our HI should be universal. Um, sorry? Uh, no, L goes like this. Arrow means functor. Through A, yeah. This is the other one should factor through A. So in other words, we have the notion of a if we have an object in here, it has a realization. For any so this is sort of the realization. Right. This is this is some category of vector spaces, some stupid category. Okay, now um, the theory is still very much alive and very interesting, and there'll be a big conference in Seattle next summer about such things. Um, but it's fair to say that we got stuck 
we got stuck uh, because essentially we got stuck in trying to define, it turns out if you want to define this as a category, you need not only objects, you need morphisms. And uh, when you tried to define morphisms, you got involved in some very difficult conjectures uh, basically about algebraic cycles uh, on algebraic varieties, and the theory got stuck. Well, that's life. Um, but um, more recently, um, there came the notion of uh, mixed motives and more especially, but more manageably, the notion of tape mixed <coughs> motives. And so what are those things? Well, I, I claim that there are certain, in, some, in a sense, they're, they're a lot easier, although slightly more complicated than these, they're a lot easier. Namely, uh, so if you think of motive as some sort of universal cohomology group, um, here's a cohomology group. Let's suppose that we're talking about the, the projective line. <laughs> Okay, as our variety. Uh, but rather than just talking about smooth projective varieties, let's be a little tricky and let's permit, for example, open varieties. So I might remove zero infinity. And then let's, rather than just talking about ordinary cohomology, we could imagine relative cohomology or cohomology with compact supports. I, I like to think of it as relative cohomology. So suppose we take the point one and some other fourth point x, which obviously will be the the key ingredient, and let's look at H1 of, of that, well, let's, let's just think of it, let's, sort of a, let's fantasize a universal H1 of that, that pair, okay? Well, uh, our universal guy should have the same kind of properties as ordinary cohomology, so in particular, uh, I don't know, I guess you can do it in your head, right? If we think of the exact sequence of relative cohomology, for the H1, what's going to happen, you're going to have H0, well, let me write it down, you're going to have H0 of P1 minus 0 infinity, mapping to H0 of the two points, mapping to H1 of the, of the pair there, and then mapping to uh, H1 of P1 minus 0 infinity. And then the next term would be uh, would be h1 of, of the points, but uh, it would be h1 of the points, but that should be zero. Clearly, we don't want points to have any higher cohomology. So uh, now, if there's any justice in the world, um, this co-kernel of this arrow here should, in some sense, be the the trivial object. So let's put. Permit me to write in coefficients here where I'll write in z, but, but maybe z doesn't quite mean what, what you think it means. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, we, we sort of. So then clearly the co kernel here should just be z. So I'm going to draw in the co kernel there. Now, on the other hand, this guy here is a little trickier. It turns out that our theory should come equipped with some twists. And we should think of this as being, well, it's sort of like z, but it should have a twist. And, and you'll understand better in a few minutes when I talk about uh, an example, the, the example of Hodge structures. But um, this should sort of be like a twisted copy of z. And so this cohomology group that I wrote down here should be thought of as an extension of z of minus 1 by z, where, if you like, you can think of this as a definition of z of minus 1 as being h1 of, of this, this complement here. And this is a definition of z as being h0 of a point. Okay. So the game then becomes, well, extension. What can we say about the extensions? Okay. So let's uh, look at this a little more carefully for a classical theory, the notion of Hodge structures. Okay. Uh, let me recall for you how Hodge structures work, and then we'll just look at the simple example, and maybe look at a couple of other examples, and then go on from there. So how do Hodge structures work? Um, 
So this is, maybe you've heard of these before. So we'll give ourselves a HZ, which will just be a free finite dimensional Z module. And if, if R is any ring, well, R is maybe bad. If A is any ring containing Z, I'll, I'll write H A will be, by definition, H Z tensor over Z. A. So a pure Hodge structure, we always start off with the best of intentions, and then we have to mix things up a little bit. So a pure Hodge structure of weight, some integer n, will be the following data. We'll give ourselves an hz. And we'll give ourselves a descending filtration on not on hz, but on h, the complexification of h. And this should satisfy the property. You see, because h is defined over z, then I have a notion of conjugation on the complexification. Because I can just conjugate the, so to speak, the coefficients, which are the complex numbers here. So it makes sense to talk about f bar dot hc, which is the conjugate filtration. And the condition is, if I don't err, that f p h c intersect f n minus p maybe plus 1 conjugate hc should be, should be 0. Did I do that now? Anyone have any objections? Should we vote? I think it's right. In any case, if I've done it right, um, the force of this rather innocuous looking condition is that if we define h p um, n minus p to be equal to the intersection f p h c intersect f n minus p. See, it's a descending filtration. And so I go, this is a little bit bigger than this. So this, so to speak, has a right to intersect the other. And if I call that intersection that, then a little linear algebra teaches you that the original HC is, in fact, isomorphic to the direct sum of HP n minus p. So that uh, sort of these data constitute a pure Hodge structure of weight n. Now, we need to get a mixed Hodge structure. So as an example of a pure Hodge structure of weight, Zn is to be a pure Hodge structure of weight, I guess, minus 2n. And so what is it to be? So to speak, Zn, Z is just Z. And uh, Zn, C. If I use this, if I do this game here, uh, this will be totally uh, concentrated in minus n minus n, and all the others will be zero. Okay. So that's sort of a stupid example. Now, obviously, uh, the main point is that if x is a smooth projective. Variety over C, then H N X Z is in a natural way or has a pure Hodge structure of weight N, where F P H N is roughly speaking. I don't want to stress this because we won't we won't be using this, but F P H N X. C 
uh, will be, so to speak, given by differential forms with at least P holomorphic uh, holomorphic what? Holomorphic parts. Or, in other words, that will involve sort of F DZ1 wedge wedge DZ locally you can write them wedge other stuff wedge eta kind of thing where eta might involve some conjugates okay well that's all kind of standard but uh, it's not really um, we're more interested in the notion of a mixed Hodge structure okay. Anyways, so, this. so a mixed Hodge structure is just a little bit more elaborate we have Sure, we have our HZ. It comes equipped with a an increasing filtration, which it turns out to be maybe better just to de assume defined rationally. So this is increasing so-called weight filtration and a decreasing filtration. Uh, with the property that the induced filtration that is induced from the, this is the so-called Hodge filtration, the induced filtration on the weight graded piece, so you take the nth weight graded piece, and complexify it and look at the induced Hodge filtration makes GER N W H Q a, uh, a pure Hodge structure of weight N. Okay. So this is kind of hard to sort of focus in on all this linear algebra, but if we look at the example that I that I wrote up before. Um, what did we have? We had essentially uh, H naught of a point, uh, let's say with Z coefficients mapped to something, uh, let's give it a name called H, mapped to essentially H1 of, let me call it, uh, well, of P1 minus 0 infinity with Z coefficients. So I want to claim that this is a mixed Hodge structure. And um, so how does it? How does it work? And actually, I'm going to get myself all confused here. Um, if I don't shift things. You see, you can kind of shift things. Instead of taking, you can put a little, it's clever to put a little one here. That has the effect of shifting all the, all the various filtrations, and things will come out better in the end. So trust me, it's OK to put a little one there. And if you put a little one there, then what this is is just z. And what this is as a Hodge structure is z of one. See, I mean, my general statement that all these things have Hodge structures mean in particular that these, well, this one's an open variety. This one has a Hodge structure. Um, let me just tell you what the mixed Hodge structure is here. Um, so I have to give you a weight filtration. I have to give a Hodge filtration. Uh, so W0 of this HQ is HQ. <coughs> And W minus um, uh, 1 of this, uh, I'm sorry, let's see what I'm going to say. I want the, yeah, W minus 1 
of this h q is to be equal to w minus 2 of this h q is to be this sub thing here is to be h naught of a point q of 1 and w minus 3 of this hq is to be 0. So in other words, the filtration, so to speak, is just, just the obvious one here. And now the, the Hodge filtration on the complexification, well, what are we talking about here? We're talking essentially about h1 of p1 minus 0 and infinity relative to 1 and some other point x uh, with complex coefficients. Okay, So there are two differential forms. If you use the Durham theory in order to interpret this cohomology, and if you write t, let's say, for the parameter on p1, then there are two differential forms that sort of stick out. The first is just dt, but I it's convenient to normalize it by dividing by x minus 1. And uh, x is constant here, so that's just sort of constant. And then there's also dt over t. OK? And it turns out that, uh, so both these classes then can be interpreted uh, as giving cohomology. Right? See, this one looks like it should be an exact thing here, but because of the relativity condition, you have to have to keep it in mind. Um, and they both give classes, and it turns out that, let's see, what do I need here? Uh, I want uh, this to be yes. You see, what do I need here? I need this z of 1 has the property that z of 1 c, if I look at the interesting guy is f1. Okay. Whereas z, the interesting guy is f0. So this fellow is going to generate f1 h c, and then when I throw this guy in, I'm going to get. Sorry, I've got it backwards here. Uh, what am I saying? This guy is going to generate f0 h. The inclusion, this is a decreasing filtration, so the inclusion, I've got it backwards. This wants to be f minus 1. That's the point. This wants to be f minus 1. Okay. So it's a decreasing filtration. So this is the smaller, we get this guy. That inclusion, so the f naught is generated by this fellow, and the f1 is generated by here. So we can summarize, then, this, this sequence. It turns out by as follows. Uh, we we'll just write down a little matrix. Um, the matrix is 1 log x and 2 pi i and 0. Okay. And now how do we think about this matrix? Just think about um, h. Z is span, so it's the Z span of the columns of 1 log x and uh, 0 and 2 pi i inside, so to speak, star, star, which I just think of as C2. Okay? And now, I, the weight filtration is, I think I can abbreviate it, zero star contained in star star. And the Hodge filtration is the other way. It's star zero contained in star. And so you see, this doesn't split. We have an extension here which does not split. 
it does not split because essentially you cannot get this first column here to be in F0. F0 is this guy. The rules would be to make it split. So let me just write this down. Our extension zero to z of one to this h to z to zero would split for it to split or so I'd better say uh, splits if and only if I could write the column uh, one. Um, zero. Um, well, if and only if I could write, uh, I could find a times one log x plus. Uh, sorry. Let's let's make things rational here. Make it A plus B times 0 to pi i equals um, 1. Uh, yeah. so get rid of the AI. 1, 0. You see? Um, right. To think about splitting, the point is that what I'd have to have is a, a fellow back here which would have to sit in F0, because it comes from F0, and I want it to split, of course, in the category of these odd structures. And it would also have to sit inside HQ. And for that element to exist, it essentially amounts to something like this, where B would be a rational number. Okay, So if I choose x to be anything interesting, it, doesn't, it can't happen. OK, so that motivates the idea of considering extensions. Well, first of, of these Hodge structures, and let's notice that we've got an interesting case here. Even though our Hodge structures are very simple indeed, we make the definition that H is a mixed, is a Tate mixed Hodge structure um, if the graded for the weight filtration minus 2n of H is isomorphic to a direct sum of copies of Q of n for all n. Okay, so my Hodge structures, they're for, built up. They're the only thing going on is the extensions. They're these stupid Hodge structures, uh, finite direct sums of, of them, but uh, uh, they're somehow glued together in some interesting uh, way. And so here's one where, where we have an interesting kind of gluing. Maybe, I mean, you, let me show you maybe two more examples just quickly, which turn out to be relevant for the sequel. Um, suppose we consider, um, let me write, um, uh, let's see, am I going to get myself in trouble here? Now, let me write delta of box n. This will be by definition, I'll take the projective line. Um, over the complex numbers. I'll throw out the point 1, and I'll take the product of that thing with itself, n times. So it's the affine, it's affine line n times. Uh, so it's affine n space, but coordinatized in a kind of a twisted way. And so inside here, I have a certain, well, let's call it s n minus 1, because I have the coordinates. Uh, I, to, 
inside each P1, I can think of the two coordinates 0 and infinity, the two points, and then I can take the product. And so what I form is a sort of a, hi a hollow hypercube inside this solo solid n cube. And so this will be the hollow hypercube, where, where one coordinate, where, where at least one coordinate equals 0 or infinity. Okay. So now I want to look at, um, it turns out to be the interesting guys to look at, at delta 2n minus 1. And I want to consider what's called an algebraic cycle. So an algebraic cycle is just a formal finite linear combination of closed subvarieties of whatever variety I'm looking at. Uh, call it Z. So I want to assume this is an algebraic cycle uh, in delta 2n minus 1. So the, these fellows are now irreducible subvarieties of delta 2n minus 1. And I want to assume they have co-dimension n. So that means they're a little bit smaller than the middle dimension. They have dimension n minus 1. So for example, if n was 2, I'd be talking about affine 3 space, and I'd be talking about things of co-dimension 2. I'd be talking, therefore, about things of dimension 1. I'd be talking about curves. So think about, if you like to have a concrete case, think about the case of curves in affine 3 space. So I want to assume that. And I also want to assume that the z does not meet the 2n minus 2 sphere in there. Now notice that's possible. And I'll give you an example in a, in a few minutes. Essentially, because we're talking, we've removed 1. In a projective situation, one would know that the z would sort of be forced to meet the things, but because this is I've removed something, essentially what it's saying is that, well, where z meets, it's it's I've I've removed it. Okay, and one can this this happens, and so in this context, um, one knows that one can define, and I'm my time is getting a little short here, so let me be a little brief. Um, Essentially, one can define the, if one looks at um, H2n minus 1, oh, sorry, let's make a cohomology, H2n minus 1 of this 2n minus 1 thing relative to the 2n minus 2 hyper sphere. Um, and let me use my, my shifting <laughs> trick to shift all the all the grades, and, and I'll, I'll think of this as Hodge structure, uh, then I can write h2n minus 1 of delta 2n minus 1. And I can remove, well, that's a, somewhat an abusive notation here. Um, let me be a little, a little cavalier about that. It's essentially. I'm leaving out a step or two here, but it's not. Um, and then, essentially, what I'm writing down is a sort of a Giesen sequence. And what comes here is the top dimensional homology of z. And the cycle, see, z is is actually comes equipped with some multiplicities. And so those multiplicities enable me to define a map from the integer z into this top dimensional homology here. This is the Giesen sequence. So what do I get? Well, this is a sphere. I mean, it's sort of spread out, expressed relatively. But topologically, if I'm computing its cohomology, it behaves exactly like a 2n minus 1 sphere. 
So one knows that the two n minus first cohomology of a two n minus one sphere is just constant. It's just the whatever the coefficient group is. So therefore, this is as a hot structure just z of n. This is as a hot structure just z, and I can in fact pull this sequence back to get an extension. I'll call it h here, or maybe h some z uh, to get a, a fellow which which looks like that. I'm going kind of quickly, but essentially what it means is that I get a map from my cycles, these z's, to extensions in the category of these mixed hot structures, x1, extensions of z by z of n. Okay, And for the number theorist amongst you, one of the motivating, one of the impetuses that got the theory rolling was the observation due to uh, various people. I, I, I hesitate to ascribe it to any one person. But the point is that one can calculate this x1 in a very naive way. I, I would plan to do it, but I don't really have time. But essentially, if you do, you find it's isomorphic to C modulo the lattice spanned by 2 pi i uh, to the n z. And the calculation that got things started was the observation that in the case n equals 3, there existed a z which was defined over Q. So now Z is now a curve in affine 3 space such that the extension class is given by zeta of 3, where this is the Riemann zeta function. So if one looked at cycles which were defined as algebraic varieties over some number field, suddenly there was interesting arithmetic information uh, to be had by looking at these extensions. So the game then that we'd like to play is we'd like to study these things motivically. That is, rather than just looking at Hodge structures, we'd like to study a more general a more universal theory, um, which will be the theory of mixed Tate motives. Okay, so we'd write to look at a universal theory So uh, well, now we gotta we gotta get down and, and dirty here, and I called it. I talked about the category of motives as being an abelian category, but that's really sort of a pale description of a much richer object. In fact, uh, we want to talk about we'll fix a field F. And we want to talk about what should be the category of mixed Tate motives on F. So I guess if you want a feeling for it, if F was the function field, the function field of a variety over C, one would like to think of as being like sort of, quote, variations of mixed Tate Hodge structures, uh, unquote, over, or let's say germs of, of mixed Tate Hodge structures over 
will there be? So sort of, you have to put the geometry in by thinking not of these sort of naive linear objects that I described, but as a, a sort of varying families of them over V in some sense. But that's just motivational. So let's look at some of the properties that this, this category should have. And what I want to do is describe some this time. So just, uh, let's see. When do I turn into a pumpkin? Uh, when did we start at about 20 um, So I turn into a pumpkin at tw 20 up. OK. You guys are free to turn into pumpkins anytime you want. Um, right, so we'd like to, what I propose to do for the rest of the hour is to describe some formal properties of this, uh, of this guy, and in particular to reduce him to a sort of a Lie algebra uh, object. And then next time, on Friday that is, I will uh, describe a candidate for the Lie algebra. <coughs> So the idea is that uh, is that M T there will be a uh, there will exist a graded Lie algebra. Uh, it's become customary to write it like this, although one might wish that it hadn't. Uh, because if writing it this way, the physicists always want to put these nasty signs in when they think of a Lie algebra uh, like this. But I forget about all nasty signs. I mean, it's just really, it should be, I, I should write it as L minus 2 plus L minus 4 plus L minus 6, but somehow. The literature doesn't do that. So there are no signs. Anyway, there will be a Lie algebra, which will be graded. And the category MTM of F should be, I mean, it's kind of hard to formulate a theorem here, because you can really more or less formulate the definition, since I haven't really told you what this category is. But uh, with any justice in the universe, the category of mixed tape motors over F should be equivalent to the category of finite dimensional graded representations of this Lie algebra. So that's sort of where we're, where we're going. We'd like to understand the geometry of this Lie algebra and also sort of the formalism that somehow passes between these objects. OK. So uh, how could such a uh, machine ever get off the ground? That's right. Uh, it really, it should be graded by the even negative integers. But somehow, uh, it didn't get started that way. And so that's why. So we need to talk about what are called Tanakhian categories. And I was about to say that I could give you a definition. But in fact, I think I probably couldn't. I, I'd, I'd probably get it wrong. Uh, but I mean, there's sort of a, a, a thought process that you should go through whenever you hear the words Tanaki in categories, which is you should think of the category of Q local systems on a topological space X. OK, just boom. A Tanaki in category is the category of Q local systems uh, I, we want to think of Q. So just think of the category of Q local systems on a topological space X. Well, what properties does this category have? Well, it's uh, an abelian Q linear category. Abelian Q linear category. And it comes equipped, if we choose a base point, x in x, a base point, 
Then we get a functor from our category, call our category something, call it uh, C, let's say. Uh, we get a functor from C to the category of finite dimensional Q vector spaces, which just sends our local system uh, on, E goes to the fiber E at the point. Okay? We get a functor, and this functor is a nice functor. It has two uh, important properties. First of all, it's an exact and faithful functor. That's important. The other property that it has is it's important is that it's compatible with tensor products. Namely, our category C, the category of Q local systems on a topological space, has a tensor product, and the fiber of a tensor is the tensor of the fibers. Okay. And it turns out whenever you have, I hope I haven't left something out. I mean, you probably have, but that's sort of the flavor of it. I can refer you to uh, Springer Lecture Notes number 900. There's a nice exposition of this theory by Deline. And Milm, one of the articles in that volume, um, it turns out when you have such a thing, uh, you can look at, call this functor or something, call it, say, phi, you can look at the automorphisms of phi. Now, what does that mean? Kind of have to think a little bit about what automorphisms of a of a functor mean, but it means, so if I have some sigma in there, what sigma is, is that for any n in, in my category C, I give myself a, an automorphism, phi of n, sigma sub n, so an isomorphism to phi of n, and for any morphism, let's say, um, rho from n to m. So here comes phi of rho, and here's phi of m, and here's sigma m, phi of m, phi of rho. The requirement, of course, is that that, that should commute. OK? Now. Time is a little tight, so uh, let me be a little bit vague, but um, well, I, maybe. Uh, it's more like the fundamental group. You should think of it as the fundamental group. You see, I mean, if, if, if my category really was the category of Q local systems on a topological space then it would be the fundamental group. Um, and I left something out. I only look at automorphisms which are compatible with the tensor, with the tensor product, in an obvious sense. Uh, then this thing here, call it G, it has a slightly richer structure. G actually is quote, meaning if I had 15 more minutes, I could explain to you how it is, uh, a pro-algebraic group. So you can give it, it's obviously just a group, as I've, uh, as I've described it here, but you can give it a somewhat richer structure such that the group that I've described here is the Q points of a pro-algebraic group. So let's look at an example. Uh, suppose that my category C was the category of finite dimensional graded, say Z graded vector spaces. Okay. And suppose that my functor phi from C to finite dimensional vector spaces was just forget the grading. Forget. Okay. 
then G, oh, sorry, giving things away here. G is just the multiplicative group GM. You see, why is that? Well, the point is that the saying that I'm working with the category of graded vector spaces limits the, the map's rho, because rho has to be compatible with the grading. Rho is an, uh, a morphism in the category C. It has to be compatible with the grading. So if I have, uh, in some sense, phi of n is just n again, but forget the grading. So if I have an automorphism of n, which on each graded piece is just scalar, it will necessarily be compatible. I'll, I'll necessarily have these commutative, commutative diagrams. But I have a further constraint, namely I require that these automorphisms be compatible with a tensor product. So that means if I fix what this is on something of degree 1, which is homogeneous of degree 1, then the stuff of homogeneous degree n is just, will be forced on me by tensor. So in fact, there's just one multiplicative scalar involved, and that, that's, the, that's what this, this means. That's a multiplicative group. So. Uh, yeah, so, right, so, yeah, that, that, in other words, the, the ought, what I'm saying is the ought tensor of phi is just Q, the non-zero numbers in Q under multiplication, but, but, you know, one, I could extend scalars, I could look at any algebra containing Q, and I could play my game over A, and it's important to be able to do that because it rigidifies, it rigidifies things. So this is the, uh, it's GL1, yeah, GL1. Does that make you, GL1, very good. Okay, so um, now let's look at my category of what this thing should be. And I want to, just as a final step for the day, try to realize this thing as some sort of a Tanakhian category and to use this formalism, OK? So let's focus on, on what this thing should be. So the semi-simple objects in this MTM, I'll drop the F should be the, I'll just call them QN. See, so just think about the case of Hodge structures, of Tate mixed Hodge structures that I talked about. The semi-simple, the simple, not semi-simple, the simple objects will just be the QN. OK? So everything's built up. And I'll have an object M. We'll have a fil weight filtration. And the graded uh, will be isomorphic to a direct sum of some finite number of copies of Q of N. OK? So the whole game is going to be then to understand what the extensions might be in this category. OK, well, let's just envision, just let's focus on this for two minutes and see what happens. Well. I can look at the functor, call it phi, from this m t m of f to graded vector spaces, where, and this idea, simple though it is, it's due to balance, and it really is very important in getting the, the whole game en route. Namely, there is a canonical fiber functor. Fiber functor was that what I'm erasing here. Uh, such a thing is called a fiber functor. It's like passing to the fiber for local systems. And here we've got a canonical one, namely phi of an object M is to be the direct sum of HOM of Q N, the simple objects, into the graded 
for the weight filtration in minus 2n of m. Okay, so I'm. This is then, in the natural way, a, a graded vector space. I assume, moreover, I should have said when I talked about simple objects that hum of q of n into q of m should be 0 if m is not equal to n and q if m equals n. This, it turns out, has the properties that are needed. Phi is uh, exact and faithful and compatible with tensor. I didn't, you didn't know that my category had a tensor product, did you? That's because I forgot to tell you. But it does. OK, just like the category of tape mixed high structures. So you see, with that in mind, then, I can go further by forget to just the category of vector spaces. And I can look at the, um, I can look at the, uh, the fundamental group, the group G. I can look at this ought tensor of, of phi. Now, the interesting piece to look at is the automorphisms of, of, of this guy here. And it turns out that that's a unipotent group. And so it's natural to look at its Lie algebra. So it's natural to look at the L, which I can think of as being the set of all L, let's say, in endomorphisms of the functor phi, such that two things are true. We have some sort of compatibility with tensor product, which here becomes the Leibniz rule, L of m1 tensor m2 should be equal to L m1 tensor identity plus uh, identity tensor L m2. And the other condition, I forget, what's the other condition? Uh, there's got to be some other condition. Uh, well, the, this, the corresponding commutative diagram, I'm out of time, so, so let's say commutative diagram. Okay. Well, I was going to show you, but I'm out of time. It turns out that this L is a Lie algebra, which is graded essentially because of the grading that we have uh, on the, this functor phi. And so L can be written as, and also it's totally in negative degrees, where L minus n is, so to speak, a, the morphisms from phi star to phi star minus n, for, if I write phi as being a direct sum, phi r. OK, so next time uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to work to try to construct. Friday. Friday, Friday. Next time we'll talk about number theory and these things, but Friday. <laughs> so. Are there any questions? I guess I, I should think of the uh, <coughs> Yeah, right. And so the, the, the Lie algebra in particular will be looking at graded representations. Should we be thinking of this as some sort of universal monodromy for the family of varieties of the base and have five structures on this family? Should we be somehow the if motors were odd structures, then this would be the uh, representation of this would be equivalent to giving yourself a variation of structures. 
But what's the motivation behind this mixed state motives? Because when you regard pure motives, then it's clear that you want to construct universal cosmology of theory. But here, it's not yeah. clear from here, what you the, really want to construct. The motivation is you'd like to, you want to construct this Lie algebra. Which do what? Whose representations will give you all the, for example, I mentioned zeta 3. You see, the Hodge theory is not enough to get your number theory. The, the idea is that representations of this L will, will have number theoretic significance, as well as geometric significance. They will be, uh, give you values of zeta functions, for example. And so it's a way of uniting all the different possible realizations. If I have a representation of this L, I'll, I'll have a Hodge theoretic realization, which will be a mixed Hodge structure. I'll have a, an l attic realization, which will be a certain Galois representation. I'll have a crystalline realization, which will be a certain Galois as well. So um, this is kind of extension of the pure motivic cohomology. Well, this, the extensions in this theory are the motivic cohomology. And then perhaps I should have mentioned that x n in this mixed tape motives of f of z z by z of p is what some people call h n motivic respect f coefficients. So this the extensions in this category will calculate the motivic F is an independent variable, right, but F is crucial. F gives you the geometry. Uh -huh. The geometry comes in by F. That's sort of totally independent. That's the geometry. That's not the coefficients. In any that's I'll not the coefficients. Right. Absolutely right. Uh, that's not the coefficients. That all the algebraic right. I made a mistake. not see. Out of the theory and not out of the theory. It doesn't leap out. 